Alrighty, everyone, and good morning. Today, we are going to be focusing on memory. Now, when we are talking about memory, we're gonna be focusing on several different types of memory. We're gonna be looking at short-term working memory and long-term memory. We're gonna be talking about how we are able to encode, process, store, and retrieve our information. So when we think about memory, this is the information that's collected and stored in our brain and is generally retrievable for later use. The way that memory works isn't yet completely understood by a lot of psychologists, but there's a census on the general process involved in how memories are encoded, stored, and retrieved. Think of your computer, excuse me, think of your brain like a computer's hard drive. Although we may not yet understand completely just how our memory works, there are many theories and models to explain how our brain processes information to form memories. Most psychologists consider many of these approaches together when studying memory. One popular model compares the brain's memory system to a computer retrieving data, converting it into an understandable code, and then storing it for later use. Although the brain's memory system is a lot more complex than a computer, this is still a useful metaphor. Only some of the information that is constantly taken in by the brain each day is remembered. Why is it? Oh, so sorry about that. Why is it that some is kept and some is discarded? It all begins with encoding, the process through which information enters our memory system. The neural activity then travels to our brains from the sensory organs, think of chapters two and three, and either enters the memory system to be stored or simply will fade away. The information that is kept and then preserved for possible recollection in the future is called our storage. That recollection is the important next step. The process of, of accessing this encoded and stored information in one's memory, this is known as retrieval. When we think about our memory, it's important for us to think about this and examine it from a levels of processing perspective. The levels of processing framework for memory suggests that a hierarchy of processing stages corresponds to different depths of information processing. In this model, processing occurs along a continuum with the shallow end focusing on physical features of objects and the deeper end concerned with patterns and meaning. If you pay little attention, shallow processing occurs, resulting in less permanent memories. With more attention, deeper processing occurs and longer lasting memories form. The more deeply you think about incoming information, connecting it to other memories and knowledge, the better you'll remember it. How do we even know about this? Craig and Tolvig explored this idea in their 1975 study in which they presented college students with information and then asked either shallow, intermediate, or deep questions about it. When the students were later tested on the material, they best remembered the information about which they were prompted to thinkly deep about. So one of the most influential models of memory, at least the functioning of it, that is often used by psychologists is the information processing model, which suggests that memory occurs in a series of stages representing a flow of information, which you can see on the screen. According to this model, the brain has three types of memory storage, sensory memory, which essentially captures near exact copies of vast amount of sensory stimuli for a very brief period of time, short-term memory, which temporarily maintains and processes a limited amount of information, and long-term memory, which has essentially unlimited capacity that stores enduring information about facts and experiences. Although the information processing model is a useful tool for exploring how memory works, it has flaws. Some critics say it's too simplistic, that sensory memory is essentially a part of perception, and that no clear boundary exists between short-term and long-term memory. As I've said before, much of the sensory information entering our brains is kept only for a short time. George Sperling was particularly interested in how much of what we see is retained in our memories. To study this, he showed participants an array of letters 
very briefly and then ask them to report what they remembered and what they saw. He found that iconic memories are photograph-like in their accuracy, but they dissolve in less than one second. Some sensory information is kept longer. Echoic memory, exact copies of the sounds we hear, can last from one to 10 seconds and can detect very slight changes in sound. We also have this eidetic imagery, which is very similar to iconic memories. So again, this just shows us on the screen of how long iconic memories last. There's a saying that you remember about 20% of what you see, 40% of what you hear, and about 80% of what you do. So as we are thinking about memory, remember that the more senses that we engage, think back to chapter three, the more senses that we are able to engage, the more that we are going to be able to retain this information. Information is not held in sensory memory for long. And the data that is, that is kept moves on to short-term memory according to the information processing model. Short-term memory has a limited capacity, allowing you to concentrate on only a tiny amount of the data that's coming in. The things that capture your attention move to short-term memory, while the rest is lost. One way to increase the amount of information that can be maintained in your short-term memory is through chunking, which means grouping numbers, letters, or other items into meaningful subsets. We also have this notion of the working memory. This is the active processing of memory in short-term memory. It helps to maintain and manipulate the information in our memory system. So when we are thinking about this, we went from sensory to short-term memory, as you see on your screen. And when we think of short-term memory, it often is gonna be part of the central executive portion of our brain. And we will see on the next slide that working memory is the memory that is currently processing. It lasts for less than a minute and is limited in capacity. In a better attempt to understand working memory, a psychologist named Alan Bedley developed the working memory approach, which led to the development of the Bedley's model of working memory. The model assumes that each component has a limited capacity and is relatively not entirely independent of the others. So what does all of this mean? Well, let's look at the components of working memory. If we go back to the previous slide, you'll see that there's the central executive, which is where our direction is, um, where our attention is directed. We also have visuospatial sketchpad, which works with visual and spatial information. An episodic buffer, which brings information together and allows us to problem solve. And the, phenom and the phonological loop, which works with verbal information. Remember, the more senses that we stimulate, the more we can retain information. So let's first look at these four components. The phonological loop processes sounds and it's responsible for speech-based information. This includes sounds that are processed in one's mind. For example, the phonological loop is used in learning new vocabulary, problem solving, math problems, and remembering instructions. In all these tasks, sounds are being processed through the phonological loop. Then we have the video spatial sketchpad. It's responsible for processing visual and spatial information. It can be fed either directly through perception or indirectly through a visual image. The video spatial sketchpad allows people to store images of objects and their locations. It's also helpful with navigation. So when you think about this, if you go from one location to another, this is the part of our brain, the video spatial sketchpad that's going to be stimulated. It's also going to be activated when you're doing things like puzzles, mazes, and games. The central executive incorporates information from the phonological loop, the video spatial sketchpad, and the episodic buffer, and from long-term memory. The complexity of the central executive is still not fully known, but some of the major functions that are involved in the central executive are the switching of retrieval plans, time sharing and multitasking, selective attention, suppressing irrelevant information, daydreaming, and the temporary activation of your long-term memory. Then we have the episodic buffer. So this was added after Badley's original model, but 
it's controlled by the central executive, but transfers information in and out of the long-term store. So it's a, it allows for a clearer connection to be made between the working memory and the long-term memory. So now we go on to the long-term memory itself. So as we just briefly went over, items in the short-term memory either fade away or move to the long-term memory. Although we don't know exactly how much information long-term memory can hold or for how long, for all intents and purposes, its capacity is limitless and the memory stored there can last a lifetime. Psychologists often distinguish between two types of long-term memory, explicit and implicit. Explicit memory is memory that you are aware of having and can consciously express in words like memories of facts and experiences. Tolving proposed two types of explicit memory. The first is somatic memory. This is the memory of information theoretically available to anyone like general facts about the world. Personal memory is referred to as episodic memory. It's the record of our memorable experiences or quote unquote episodes, including when and where an experience occurred. Our most vivid episodic memories are often associated with some type of intense emotion. These memories detailed accounts of circumstances surrounding some type of emotionally significant or shocking, even historic event is known as a flashbulb memory. That would be for anyone who was around for 9-11. That's part of a flashbulb memory. They'll remember exactly where they were at that time. Although explicit memory is the memory for facts or events that you can easily state, implicit memory is the memory of something you know or know how to do, but that might be automatic or unconscious and is difficult to bring to awareness and express. That could be something like driving a car. A type of implicit memory that we use all the time is procedural memory, which is the unconscious memory of how to perform a variety of skill and activities. So again, procedural memory is driving a car. Implicit memory could be putting your key into the car, could be putting on your seatbelt, just because it's so automatic in what we do, it's just part of our implicit memory. Again, with implicit memory, it's something that you know how to do, but it's so automatic, it's difficult to bring to awareness and to express. So if you or someone you know is involved in a car accident, they, over time, as that time fades, they may find that putting on that seatbelt is implicit, but the procedural is going to be actually driving the car. So let's look at some stages of memory. There's a couple of ways that we can go about improving our memory. The first we're gonna look at is called mnemonic devices. Mnemonic devices are techniques that are used to improve memory. Many such devices are used to help remember information, a lot of which you might do without even realizing it. The first letter technique and acronyms are common mnemonics. This is similar to chunking, which is what we had discussed just a few minutes ago. The method of loci technique involves imagining a familiar path and placing the things you need to remember at points along the way. You can also arrange things to be remembered into a hierarchy or into a system of some type of meaningful way for you to remember things. So here are just some additional ways that you can improve your memory. Um, we have the automatic and the um, effortful processing, oops, so sorry, which is part of the levels of processing framework. And it's often part of this deeper thinking that can result in memories. So effortful processing is encoding and storage of information with conscious effort or awareness. It's intentional and it takes work and it occurs on a deeper level resulting in longer lasting memories. When we talk about maintenance rehearsal, this is a technique that's used to increase the length of time that information is kept in the short term memory by repeating the information over and over again. So for example, if you're given a phone number that you need to remember, you might repeat it over and over to yourself until you can write it down or put it into your phone. Elaborative rehearsal is a method of connecting incoming information to knowledge in long term. Um, again, this is part of the loci mnemonic and can be also connected to elaborative rehearsal. So when we talk about doing, um, when we look at the hierarchical structures, 
this is where you're putting things in a in a hierarchy matter. So if you're creating an internal list in your head of all the things that you need to do, it might be what is the most time sensitive at the top and then down throughout the day, everything else that you need. Mass practice, which is studying for long periods of time without breaks, is often gonna be less effective for encoding information into the long-term memory than spreading out study sessions over time with breaks in between. Then we have distributed practice. This is where you are going to break out that information over periods of time with breaks in between. The best advice for boosting memory is honestly to get enough sleep. So when we think about sleep and we think about how sleep is super important to us, we need to remember that sleep helps us to essentially I'm trying to think of how to even put it in words. When you think about sleep, sleep happens in five stages. You have stage one, two, three, four, and REM sleep, which we're actually gonna be talking about in a future chapter. The reason that we have those five stages is because it prepares our bodies essentially for us to be able to take this information, the information that um, we need throughout the day and store it. It also helps our bodies to repair any muscle tears as we move throughout the day. Um, or even if you lay throughout the day, you're going to find that there's going to be these microscopic um, tears in our muscles. Those tears help us to essentially our bodies during sleep will repair those tears and prepare our bodies for the next day when we have a lot of things going on. It helps with taking this information and putting it into the, the sensory, from the sensory memory into short-term memory or working memory and long-term memory. Without it, you may find that you are foggy, agitated or irritated. You may find that processing information or retrieving information is going to be more difficult. You won't store as much information and you're at increased risk for several things like type two diabetes, stroke or cardiovascular or heart related in, um, issues. So we had talked about this in the six hour day. How do you study smarter? It is seen here on the screen. Start studying early. Recall the details that you need and use mnemonics to help you. Organize the information that you need and start making those connections. Give yourself plenty of time to start studying, especially considering that we have a test coming up in two weeks. Start now in, or next week. Start studying now so that you can prepare for chapters five, six, and seven. And also get some rest. The more rest you get, the better you'll be able to work. What can you actually retrieve? So with all of these efforts to better encode and store memories, they're useless unless you can also retrieve them. Retrieval without <clears throat> the use of any cues is known as recall. <clears throat> this is the type of retrieval you would use when answering a fill in the blank question. To answer a multiple choice question, you would use recognition. This matches incoming data to information that's stored in the long-term memory. Retrieval cues are stimuli that help in the retrieval of stored information that might be more difficult to access. If you're trying to remember someone's name and your friend whispers the first letter into your ear, it may help you think of the entire name. The stimulation of memories through retrieval cues, this is known as priming. So I want you to think for a second. You're at the grocery store and your you know, friend or family member, they call and ask you to pick up five more items. Your ability to remember this list of new items without writing it down depends on the item's placement in the series. Oh, sorry, y'all. So when we think about this, this is part of the effect. So we have the serial position effect. Again, the placement of the items in your series. You're most likely to remember the item at the beginning of the list. If that's you, that's the primary effect. If you're most likely to remember the last item of the list, if that's you, that's the recency effect. As shown by Godin and Badley's classical experiments, 
Context also matters in memory, especially memory retrieval. These researchers instructed participants to study information in two contexts, either underwater with scuba gear or on land. Their recall was then tested in both situations. The participants were better able to remember the information in the same situation in which they learned it. This context-dependent memory is part of the encoding specificity principle. This states that memories are more easily recalled when the context and cues at the time of encoding are similar to those at the time of retrieval. This suggests that activity in your brain at the time of encoding is similar to that of retrieval, which has been supported by functional MRI studies. Memories, they're also more easily retrieved when your mood and emotions are similar to when they were created. This is called a state-dependent memory. So how easily do we remember things? When we look at the screen, you can see that, again, mood and memory help with deeper processing and retrieval. If our mood is similar, then you will find that there is some type of congruence. So again, if you are if you are looking at a state dependent memory, this is when you're going to retrieve it. The memory will be the same as when you were, when you had actually learned it. So, in addition to recall and recognition, there's a more subtle form of retrieval that also takes place when you're learning material for a second time. When you are essentially relearning material that you learned previously, you're gonna require that information more quickly in subsequent exposures. This concept was first recognized by Herman Ebbinghaus, who used himself as the sole participant of his experiment. He learned lists of nonsense syllables and then put them aside for later. When he picked up the list to memorize them again, he timed himself to see how fast he learned the list and determined that we get sort of like a savings when we relearn material. Learning something for the first time is difficult, but learning for a second time is faster and easier because you have some memory of the retrieval. So that could be very similar to um, an example could be if you are learning a language again. It's something that you may have learned before um, many years ago. And as you go to reintroduce yourself to that and relearn the information, you'll find via Ebbinghaus that you can learn that information a lot quicker because you've learned it once before. Bowers had talked about how people who have knowledge of a language from early life often show some type of memory savings when they try to relearn it again as adults. So Bowers built a lot of his information off of Ebbinghaus. So when we are continuing to look at Ebbinghaus, we can have some memory slips. Essentially, it's us forgetting things. So what causes us to actually forget? Error can occur in any stage of memory processing, encoding, storage, processing, retrieval. If information never enters the memory system, an encoding error causes you to forget. If you weren't paying attention to the event, it may never enter into your memory at all, and you'll be unable to recall it later. We also have, oops, sorry, we also have a storage failure that can result in memory lapse. If you cease to use the information in your long-term memory, it can decay and become inaccessible. What about that feeling that memory is just kind of out of reach? That is an example of retrieval failure called the tip of the tongue phenomenon. Most of us feel this fairly often, but are able to eventually retrieve the information about half the time. What if you never forgot anything? This is the case for individuals with what's called hyperthymestic syndrome, but forgetting has adaptive advantages to so remember everything can interfere with the thought process. So here we're looking at Ebbinghoff's curve of forgetting, which typically will occur within the first hour of learning and then often will level off. The tip of the tongue is the, is, isn't only the type of retrieval error that you can experience. Retrieval can be influenced or even blocked by information we learn before or after a memory is formed. So proactive interference is the tendency for information learned in the past to interfere with retrieval of new information. Retroactive interference is the tendency for recently learned information to interfere with the retrieval of things learned in the past. Imagine 
again, that you learned Spanish, let's say, as a second language when you were in middle school um, or even early high school. When you try to learn Italian as an adult, you may find Spanish words slipping in to confuse you. Then after learning Italian, you may find it difficult to remember your Spanish because more recently learned in Italian words do the same thing. So the process of when you are trying to learn Italian but Spanish words slip in, that's part of the proactive interference. If you remember it, if you solely remember Italian and then forget Spanish altogether, that's part of the retroactive interference. We also have this notion too of the misinformation. So even though we can forget information, the possibility also exists that we remember, that what we remember, excuse me, could be inaccurate. If you compare your memory of a child event with your sister's memory of the same event or brother's information, the same event, chances are your stories are not exactly the same. Stored memories are constantly updated and revised, changing exactly what was remembered. So. There's a psychologist named Elizabeth Loftus, and she's been studying memory and its reliability for a long time, over 40 years. She suggests that our accounts of past events shouldn't be expected to be identical to those of others or even our own previous renditions of the events. She proposed a reconstructivist model of memory in which memories are understood as creative blendings of fact and fiction. Memories may fade or influence by information learned after they were formed. Memories aren't mirrors of reality, but rather it's going to be our perception of it. So this can be related to false memories because Elizabeth Loftus also looked at rich false memories. They're detailed recollections of an event that never occurred and are expressed with emotions and confidence. She found in a 1995 study that she did that about 25% of participants were able to quote unquote remember an event that they ne that never actually happened. They asked the relative to record three real shared events and one plausible story about a trip to a shopping mall that never occurred. They asked the participants to recall as many details as possible about all four events. And 29% of the participants were able to remember details about this false event. So what does that tell us? It tells us that when we have emotions that are deeply connected with some type of memory, whether they are real or not, it's our perception that enable us to encode this information. As you go through your day, you draw heavily on memory to complete most, if not all of what you do. If everything you do relies so much on memory, Important processes must be taking place in the brain. One way to study how memory works as the brain is to look at what happens when it's damaged. Seriously, just damaged. We know that there are two different types of amnesia. There's antegrade and retrograde amnesia. Antegrade amnesia is an, an inability to create new memories following some type of damage to the brain or injury to the brain. Retrograde amnesia is an inability to access memories formed before damage or injury to the brain, <clears throat> or there's difficulty in retrieving them. So again, retro means before, antro means after. So retrograde amnesia is where you can't retrieve old memories, but you can form new ones. And antegrade amnesia, you can retrieve old memories, but you can't form any type of new memories. This is something that is being studied in our brains, especially in light of a lot of the different issues that are occurring within our sports systems. Um, football, for example, being one of them. So we're gonna stop here today. We just covered a lot of information in this half hour, and I wanna make sure that you have the ability, <clears throat> excuse me, that you have the ability to process some of this information. Um, make it from your short-term memory and working memory into your long-term memory as much as possible. So we're gonna pick up here on Wednesday and we're gonna cover the last few chapter, or last few um, bits of information from this chapter. And we also have a couple of different activities that are gonna help us with understanding 
how our memory works and how we can access and store and retrieve this information later. Does anyone have any questions about anything that was reviewed today? You can unmute your microphone uh, by clicking the little microphone icon at the top and just clicking it. Or you can ask the question in the box, the chat box to the right of your screen. Because if nobody has any questions, you are more than welcome to leave as soon as I take attendance. Let me just pull this up real quick. Um, and then I will stick around so that, again, if you do have any questions, that I am able to help kind of answer them and guide us through this process. Okay, um, for those of you who have not turned in your rough draft, we had quite a number of people who did not turn in the rough draft of their literature review. Please, please, please make sure that you turn that in as quickly as possible so that I can offer feedback as soon as possible to prepare you for your final version. Um, we are missing at this point, uh, like I said, uh, quite a number, <clears throat> excuse me, quite a number of literature reviews. Um, in looking here, I only, out of the 30 of us in the class, I am missing one, two, three. I'm missing nine of them. So if you are one of the nine people who didn't have a chance to turn it in, take this next 25 minutes to work on it and try to submit it. Feel free to make an appointment with me on Calendly so that I can support you through that process. Um, for those of you who have turned in and on time, thank you. I will be getting to that today uh, to grade for you. So you should have a grade in the next couple of days. Um, but I hope all of you have a great day. Feel free to stick around if you have any questions. And I will see you all on Wednesday. Have a good one, y'all.